Well, good morning, everybody. About to dig into Genesis here, chapter 4, where not only like with the video we just saw regarding what is life and what happens when an animal dies, we're going to see for the first time in recorded history what happens when a human dies. With the story has been infamous for just ever, Cain and Abel. And what happens when Cain killed his brother Abel? So it's going to be a relatively uh, dark chapter. Uh, it's, I think it's also going to have a little bit of challenge for us. And we're going to go a different route than what many of you might perceive for this chapter to be able to go. So anyway, turn your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 4, as we get to learn about, well, Cain. Isn't that great? Are you pumped? Yeah. Oh, good. Well, at least I'm pumped, and some of you are too, so that's awesome. So the five of us are going to have a blast. Uh, everyone else, hope you'll just hop on board the train here and have a good time. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Merciful Heavenly Father, it is such an honor and a privilege that we can come here and to be able to worship you, sing songs to you, give tithes to you, and to study your word. I ask, Lord, this morning that you help our minds to be focused, you help our hearts to be open. That as we study your word with your spirit, you might convict us and draw us closer to you. This I pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, so far to try to you know recap a little bit, to get, get you up to speed, especially if you haven't been with us over the past uh, couple of weeks when we started the book of Genesis. In chapter 1, we had discovered that God made everything that there is. That who cares what science tries to say? It's not an issue of evolution. It is an issue of creation, that God created it, that the first three days God spent forming all there is, and then in three days afterwards, he filled all that he formed. Okay, and then on the sixth day, he made, well, the first person ever, man, the Hebrew word of which is Adam, or as we call it ever so lazily, Adam. So uh, if anybody knows somebody named Adam, go up to him and call him Adam and, and see if they can figure out what you're doing. Because it's technically the same word. And good little joke for you to be able to do. And so when God made uh, Adam in chapter 2, what we discover is that, well, chapter 1 was like an overview. And then in chapter 2, is like a zero in. It's where we get the toledote or the account of or the generations of, depending on the context for that translation. We get the account of the heavens and the earth. We find out that God made Adam and that, or Adam, and that Adam, it was not good for him to be alone. So God created a nagging, I mean, a, a beautiful blessing, uh, a woman, a, a, the, Isha, the Isha out of the Ish, the woman taken from a man. So he made, who was later called, called Eve, and so they were to work together, and she was a super help, or helper suitable for him. Then, in chapter 3, we get a surprise, almost like a twist ending, if you will, or a plot development. Uh, Moses ever so craftily writes this out to indicate that there was a serpent. Now, there was this serpent. Now, it wasn't just a snake. Uh, there is this evil that is lurking within this serpent that is actually Satan, who is using this serpent to try to twist the things of God, to try to distract uh, Adam and Eve from the goodness of God and to move them towards some other gain by questioning God's goodness, by creating doubt, by saying that, you know, why did God remove this one tree from you? Go ahead and eat it. it it'd be fine. You'll gain wisdom. And like Satan likes to do, he always promises with sin and temptation what is gain, but never really says what will be lost. And so uh, they ate from the tree, and what was lost was life itself, a relationship with God. They found themselves separated from God. So chapter 3 ends with God kicking Adam and Eve out of the garden, which was actually a blessing, not, a, not, not a, really a punishment. The idea was that once they ate, once they fell, once they sinned, that once the curses and all the punishments were put into place, that they were now in a decaying body, separated from God. And so God wanted to be united with them again, so he drives them from the garden so that they don't eat from the tree of life. Because it appears that Adam and Eve were made from the beginning mortal beings, for only God is truly, fully, like, immortal of that type of nature like that. So he made these mortal humans in his image, and so they were to eat of the tree of life to live forever. And so God, not wanting them to live forever in a dying, separated body, kicks them out of the garden, protects the tree, 
eventually at some point, we don't know what happened to the tree of life, but it is likely that God took it up into heaven with him. We find that it appears on the new earth in Revelation 21 and 22, when we get the new Jerusalem and the new earth and the, uh, the throne of God is placed and this river flows out of the throne of God and the tree of life appears on both sides of the river, almost like the big redwoods that we see where you've got this tunnel in between the tree that you can go through. And that's what this river does is goes through the tree like that. And, and people come and they eat from the tree. And so that appears to be that God wants to continually sustain life himself through the tree that he had provided. And so now that they're separated from that, death enters into the picture. That then brings us to chapter 4. And so if you have your Bibles, chapter 4, verse 1. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve. She conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I had gotten a man-child with the Lord. Some translations add the phrase, with the help of the Lord. Now, let's pause here for a moment. We could read on and see more of what happens, but let's hit the pause button here. Uh, first things first. Adam had relations with his wife. Okay, so we just need to hammer that out for a moment. I know you might be like, let's not talk about that. That's that sex stuff, and that's, oh, it's just, we don't need to hear about that. Well, God wrote it. He had it written through the pen of Moses, so let's talk about it. Okay, here, there's a theory, and I've run across it here at our church in the past, that Cain is actually an offspring of Satan and Eve, not Adam and Eve. There was that theory that was posed to me that in that garden that the serpent was tempting Eve, it was all about sex, and that, that Cain was actually a half-human, half-spiritual uh, being, and that it was half-Satan, half-Eve's uh, child, and that that's what Cain was. And there was even a movie like about seven or ten years ago called Dracula 2000 that had like Dracula with the descendant of Cain because there was something special about Cain, and it comes a little bit from that type of a theory. Scripture does not agree with that. First of all, whenever you have pregnancy, it's only going to happen with like animals. Okay, pregnancy only happens with like kind. You can't conceive when something is different. You can't take a monkey, cross it with a whale, and get a wonky. Okay, you're not, it's not happening. Okay, you're not going to find some whale going, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, eating bananas. It's just not happening. Or, or a monkey with a big long tail that just flaps people. It, it, it doesn't work. It has to be of like kind. So Satan can't impregnate anybody at all being an angelic being that's a different kind than human and on top of that a serpent definitely is not impregnating a person okay it's just not happening first that's gross ew okay coming up with that theory someone needs to get more sleep at night that's <laughs> just bizarre and secondly scripture goes against that completely 100 percent what does it say here in verse one at the very beginning now the man Adam, the man, the, the person, not the serpent. I know some ladies will call men snakes. It doesn't mean they are, okay? They still are human. They act like snakes. They act like pigs, but they're not literally either of those. It's metaphor, people, okay? So that's not what's happening. Some people will even point to 1 John, because 1 John says that Cain is the child of the devil. And so they see, there it is. See, that's proof. That's our proof text. Cain's the child of the devil. Therefore, the serpent used by Satan had to have conceived. No, 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 no. Okay? You guys, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. But who went with who to conceive you? I know it's a gross thought, but your mom and dad. Okay? <laughs> That's stuff for comedy later. But, but it's your mom and dad that did that. Okay? Your, your, your dad looked at your mom, went, Bleh, and there you were. Okay? That's, that's, the, that's the PG version. <laughs> and there you were. Okay? Now, if you are saved by God's grace through Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. Okay? It is a status that you have, like an adoption that takes place. So it doesn't mean that you were literally at your mom conceived with God. That would be weird. Okay? It was your mom and dad. That's how that works. Works. Women are now the author of life like that. They, they are able to produce life within themselves. Okay? So that child.
child of often is about who your allegiance is with. Throughout Scripture, the child of is often an allegiance. So first John is indicating with the child of the devil type title for Cain, not that he was literally an offspring of Satan, but rather his allegiance at that point was of evil. Okay, so that's what that's talking about. So, now that we got through that, <laughs> verse 2, again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Were Cain and Abel twins? Possible. You know, I, we don't know. It's weird that we do find that when she gave birth to Seth, that we got this whole, and Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to Seth. We don't get a lay with. We don't get a conception notice. We get this and again, almost as if it happens right away. Almost as if she gave birth to Cain, and then all of a sudden, she's like, whew, I'm glad that's over. And then Adam goes, uh uh, something's peaking. You better get ready for a sequel. And then out came a second child. It's almost as if that's what's happening here. Okay, we, we don't know. You can go either way on it. You can, I, I tend to, I find it intriguing the idea that it might be twins. I find that intriguing. It, there's a lot to be said to that. You can say that they were not twins, that there's time in between here, that she just, that the and again is about the knowing and conceiving, and that that is a repetition of that act. That's perfectly legit. You won't be a heathen going either way, okay? You might be a heathen if you say the Satan spawned it. But you won't be a heathen if you go either way, twin or not twin. Okay, that, that part's okay. So somehow, either a twin or a second birth, she gives birth to Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Okay, so this is their jobs. Cain's a farmer... And Abel's a dude ranch man, okay? <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a cow wrangler. He's, so those are the two people. The older brother, one grabs a hoe and tills the ground, if you will, and the other one deals with animals and different livestock. Okay, so that's, that's their jobs, farmer and ranch hand, if you will. So that's a little bit of what they are and what they do and who they are. And then it goes on in verse 4. Actually, in verse 3, So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. What we start getting here is they both bring an offering, Cain and Abel. In the course of time is a phrase that means sometime later. How much later? I don't know. They're, they're old enough to be able to be working. They're old enough to be able to be bringing offerings to God on their own. They worship God on their own. Uh, it could be 20 years later. It could be 100 years later. We honestly have no idea. It was just in the course of time. Some time later, Cain brought an offering. Notice it's offering, not sacrifice. Okay, that's just important to note right off the bat. He brought an offering, not a sacrifice. Just kind of plug that away in the back of your mind. We'll eventually be coming back to that. Now comes something interesting. I'm going to divert just for a moment. There's been a lot of negativity placed on Cain. In many cases, rightfully so. I mean, he did eventually, he was going to kill his brother. Not a nice guy to do something like that, okay? At the same time, I do want to give him a little bit of defense. And now you're looking at me weird, like, okay, <laughs> where are you going? I see a pastor search committee is already forming in the back corner. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> I don't know why my wife is the chair. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, uh, and you're looking at me kind of weird. Let me offer this. Many people look at Cain and they criticize uh, whether his offering was legit or not. Was it a first fruit? Was it not first fruit? He killed his brother. He's obviously a wicked man. But at least he came to worship God with something. Okay, he actually showed up to give God something. Many people in today's churches show up at worship giving nothing. Okay, uh, so at least Cain brought something. Now, I'm not saying that it just has to be of a monetary issue. Some people show up just about what they can get. I mean, that's their attitude. They, they treat the church like a mall. You know, do you go to Rivertown or do you go to Woodland Mall? Well, it depends on what you want to get. You know, do you want to just some entertainment? You want to walk around and see some stores? Most people go to Rivertown. Why? There's more of it. They got different little play areas that are bigger and more fun and, and all this and that. But 
then they'll go to Woodland if they want other stores that Rivertown does. It's all about what we can get. Church is not supposed to be that way. Worship service are not supposed to be that way. But people come with the attitude of, what can I get? And you can t I can always tell when that attitude is here, when I have people say something, something to the effect of, well, I'm not happy with the child care, or I wasn't happy that your youth group was so small, or I wasn't happy that your music was too loud, or your sermon was too long, or, or you didn't tuck your shirt in, or you wear jeans, or whatever. And people will complain about how they didn't get what they wanted to get out of it. And the question isn't what do we get, it's what do we come with? It's not about getting, it's about giving. And it's a worship service. We're supposed to come to give God our worship. And I've had some people even show up and they'll say something to the effect of, well, you know, I attended once, but it didn't really feel like home. Have you ever had that? You know, I was puzzled by this. For the longest time, my wife and I, uh, we went to a garage sale that was in a church, and we walked in, and we were so confused. We were like, man, it didn't feel like home. And we couldn't figure out why. The people were friendly. This place was, was relatively big. It was bright. It was nice. The people made jokes. Uh, one of them made a, a joke that was a little bit odd, and I thought, cool, I'm not the only weirdo on the planet. But yet I didn't laugh. I didn't feel in place. I couldn't figure out why I wasn't at home. And then it dawned on me over this past week. I don't feel home at restaurants either. <laughs> I mean, think about it for a moment, okay? You, you don't feel, I don't feel at home. Maybe you might feel at home at a restaurant, but, but I don't feel at home at a restaurant, okay? Why? Because I'm not giving anything. Well, I might give money for the food, but ultimately, what happens in a restaurant? It's all about what you get. You get waited on. If it's too hot, you can send it back for a colder one. If it's too cold, you can send it back for a hotter one. If you want your steak done medium well and it comes back medium rare, you can send it back, unless, of course, you're a wuss and you don't. Uh, but, but you can send it back and say, cook this a little bit longer. They might hock a loogie on it, but you'll get it back warmer. You know, <laughs> you, know you, you can, you can, you have to clean up? No. When you're done eating, what do you do? You grab your stuff and you leave. Leaving dishes there, cups there. And some people will even pile up their dishes. There's a big old thing of ketchup. They'll grab their napkin and go right in the middle of it. And they'll put all their stuff together. And it's like, oh, I'm organizing it. Yeah, now you made it gross. <laughs> you know, my wife and I, one time, we even took our ketchup and we took different food. We drew a face out of our food on our plate. Okay, we, we did this. I'm not making this up, okay? We, we took french fries and we made a mouth. And we took pieces of potato to make an eye. We had like a fork and a knife we even use for different body things, you know. We're just making, <laughs> we made a mess. And what do we do when we were done? We left. <laughs> With a good tip, mind you. I tip well. And if I feel like that I still want to tip well, but they didn't give me good service, I will leave something for them to do good work with. <laughs> Not rudely so, chill. But it doesn't feel like home because we're not doing anything. What do you do at home? You work, you give, you participate. It's part of the experience of what home is. You participate, right? You, you, you cook, you clean, and if you don't clean all the dishes right away, you put them on something and you wait till they stink, then you clean. Either way, you're doing the cleaning, right? And since so you're, you're, you're putting stuff out, you set the table, you don't, you, you use uh, silverware, paper products, glass, whatever it is. And if you have kids, what do they do? Set the table, right? I, so many times my parents have said, John, set the table. Uh, why? You want to eat, don't you? We're family. We work together. Okay? It's about participating. It's about giving. You want church to feel more like home? Start participating. Yeah, you got it. You start giving. Okay, you, you work toward giving. Why did that one church not feel home to my wife and I? We were there to get it wasn't supposed to feel like home. Besides, this is home. <laughs> okay? You know, it wasn't like we were there handing in resumes. We wanted to buy doll clothes for a doll for our baby to play with in, in a little bit. That's why we were there. It was a garage sale. It wasn't supposed to feel like home. We weren't giving. Oh, yeah, they got money from us, but we was like an exchange. We were there to get. We were not there to give. 
Okay, so that's the difference. You want this place to feel like home? Start giving. Start participating. Okay, here, that's what we're saying. Mean, why are you here today? Let me just throw it right out to you now. Ask yourself this. Why are you even here today? Are you here to get something? You hope that, you know, that maybe the pastor's not boring. I hope his joke is good. I hope he has some insight. I hope the music is okay. Are you all about getting? Or did you come here to say, Lord, I give you my unemployment. Lord, I give you my job. Lord, I give you my voice. Lord, I give you a tithe. Lord, I give you my spouse. I give you my family. I give you my life. Lord, I praise you. I worship you. Here am I. Use me. Why are you here? As much as we might wanna much as we might wanna criticize Cain, point fingers at Cain, and judge Cain for all the wicked things he does do, at least he came with something to give to God. Some of us don't even give that. Which means we're no better off than Cain, and in may, many cases we might even be worse. So Cain comes and he brings something. Verse 4, And Abel on his part also brought the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. Let's pause there for a moment. <laughs> oh, this is odd. One, God accepts. The other one, God rejects. Now, people have dealt with this for a long, 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 long time. I mean, much ink has been spilt over this issue. I have read commentary after commentary, book after book, uh, theology manual after theology manual that tries to deal with hermeneutics and interpretation, trying to handle what is happening here. Why did God reject Cain's offering? but accept Abel's. Some people pointed to the fact that uh, Cain gave fruit and that that was bad for Cain to even give fruit because the Mosaic Law is all about giving animals. Well, that's only true with sacrificial system. Fruit is a totally legit offering for offerings. So is grain and seed. So when God looks at an offering, he doesn't look at, oh, you gave more, yours counts more. What did Jesus say about something like that? When an old lady gave just a mite, other people were giving hundreds of dollars. That one penny Jesus regarded as being better than the hundreds of dollars because it was more sacrificial of a giving. So it's not about amount. It's not that animals are better than fruit. Although I prefer a steak. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just be honest with you. You know, you want to come over to my house. What do you want me to bring? I can bring a fruit tray or I can bring a thing of barbecue ribs. <laughs> oh, boy. I'll tell you right now. Bring the ribs. <laughs> okay? It's just, you know, as, as a preference. But it's not about value. Okay? So that's not the issue here. Some people think it's because of first fruits. That, that, uh, that Abel gave of his first fruit because it says he gave of his first fruits. That would mean the best. That, Cain, that Abel went through his flock, found his best animal, and then gave that to God. And then the fat portions, that would be even the best portions. I mean, I don't know about you, the fat portions are the yummiest part of a steak. I mean, when I bite into a steak, if I'm at Outback or Logan's and I get a good ribeye and there's a big thing of fat around the side, oh man, I'm going to be happy. Okay, yeah, you're getting hungry now. That's the <laughs> I'm going to call this short and go have lunch. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, oh, that's the best stuff right there. So that he gave the best. And then the implication is that Cain didn't give the best. The implication is that Cain only gave some fruit, but not of his best fruit. That he looked at his collection of fruit and went, okay. Um, this part are really good. These aren't so good. I'll give these. It's not like God cares. There's a bruise on my strawberry. You know, some people wonder if that's what's going on here. Some people consider the fact that it could be that since it says that also gave of the first fruits, that maybe they both gave of the first fruits, and that it would be an awkward grammatical usage to say first fruit of fruit. I almost can twist my tongue on that. You know, that maybe that it's just this more implied that, of course, the fruit was the first fruit. It's just there was something else going on. I'm going to pose this for you. 
I want to say either way is fine that the problem wasn't with the offering. That's going to be the view that I'm going to hold, okay, that the problem was not the offering. I do not think that the offering spoiled the relationship with God. I don't think that the offering spoiled Cain. I think Cain spoiled the offering. I think the problem was with Cain, not the offering. In fact, I, I think that's how it even is read here. That's how it comes across. Look at verse 5 here. How does it start off? But for Cain and for his offering. The subject, the emphasis is on Cain. It is Cain that is that God is not showing favor to, not the offering. Okay, the emphasis is there. It's Cain. God rejects the offering because of Cain. God's rejecting Cain because of Cain, not because of the offering. So that would mean then, then what did Cain do? What did Cain possibly do to lose God's favor? Well, for one thing, he choke slammed the big show last week. That's... Okay, that was WWE. Sorry, that's the wrong Kane. <laughs> Anybody watch wrestling? Oh, come on, that's some good stuff right there. I'll tell you that right now. If you can get a hold of WWE SmackDown Friday night sci fi, there it is. Right. But anyway, that wrong Kane. Uh, what did Kane possibly do? Okay, that's the question. And. People have wondered this, pondered over this, trying to figure this out. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 gives some insight here. Now, some people, they, they're good Bible people. I, they know it. They're like, yeah, there's the verse. I was expecting you to turn to that verse. <laughs> they're not. Or you've got vertical verses in the middle of your Bible that might have that as a reference. But 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 gives some insight as to what's happening in the life of Cain. And John is indicating within that verse that Cain's life and actions are not like Abel's life and actions. Okay, That one seems to be righteous, the other one not. There's a big comparison that is drawn, paralleling them side by side. And what is actually happening within that brother-brother relationship is a very important attitude, and that is jealousy. Jealousy is what is going on. Cain was jealous of Abel. That's how John is describing this. He is saying that here are these two lives. One is wicked, the other one's not. They aren't the same life, and Cain desired the other one's life. There's a jealous attitude that is at play here that is going on within Cain. And this jealousy could have led Cain not to give his first fruit. If you want to go down that path, you could easily draw that conclusion that Cain thought that, hey, you know, I give strawberries, he gives a lamb. I give apples, he gives a cow. Mine will never match up to his. So what difference does it make anyway? I don't have to give my best because in the end, it's really just useless. So I'll just give a little bit, whatever. It's not like Abel's, oh, I wish I could be a hand, a ranch hand. I wish I could have a flock. I wish I could have animals. I give a basket of berries. He comes in with this bull, with this cow, with this lamb, with this, these, these animals, and oh, how much nicer are those? You put a strawberry over open fire, nothing. You put a lamb over open fire, mmm. You know, oh, how much more of a sweet aroma that gives. Oh, I, who knows what jealousy is going on, or how he's working that through. Verse Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, God himself states that he sees the condition of the human heart and weighs the motive of the worshiper. That it's not about the offering that you give. It is about the heart of the, how you're given the offering. It is about what is happening inside. It's how you are giving. The condition of that. I know some people, they show up to worship services with jealousy in their hearts. I run across jealousy on a daily basis. I run across jealousy of people that will look at my wife and they'll be jealous of her because she can have kids, because she's pregnant. And she says, and my wife sometimes is jealous of people who aren't pregnant. <laughs> it goes both ways. I know people that are jealous because so-and-so has a husband or a wife. They're married. I wish I could be married. And I've known some married couples that were jealous because they weren't single. 
And they wish they could be single too. And there are people that are jealous for so many different things. You know, I wish I had their job. I wish I had their lack of debt. I wish I had their income. Or I wish I had their family, their parents, their house, their car, their TV, their sound system, their internet connection. I wish I had their neighborhood. I wish I could have kids. I wish I had their kids. I wish I didn't have kids. I'm jealous of all these people that have everything I don't have and I'm jealous of everything that they got that I want and am lacking and that You know, churches will fight back and forth. Who had the most baptisms? I'm like, praise God, there were people that got saved and then baptized. I don't care who had more. I'm not jealous that some church had more than us. I'm not jealous at all. I'm excited people got saved. I'm excited that people responded in baptism afterwards. That's what gets me just geared up. I'm hoping that at our next annual meeting when all the churches get together, we can just celebrate one number and not all the numbers of all the churches. We can just celebrate together. People came to Christ. Hallelujah. That's awesome. And not have this jealousy. So Cain has this jealousy. His, when, when God just looked at it and said, Cain, you're not coming at me with a proper heart. I want you, not your offering. Your offering is worthless if your heart is distant. That's the attitude God has in, in Malachi. And that's the attitude God has all throughout Scripture. God is consistent. That would be the attitude He has here. God rejects, does not look upon with favor upon Cain's offering. Cain's countenance falls. Now he's angry. It's one thing to, to fail at something. It's another thing to have it pointed out. Anybody like to have their failings pointed out? Okay, and when they point it out, you have two options. You can either say, I'm sorry, I messed up and try to do better, or you can get angry and start shutting that person out. Cain chose the bad route. He started to get angry. His countenance begins to fall. Verse 6, the Lord, oh, so patient calls out to Cain and tries to guide him, tries to comfort him, and says, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you would do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and his desire is for you, but you must master it. Here's what God is saying to Cain here. Knowing Cain's heart, God offers Cain guidance and a warning. This is a very patient God here. Okay, that's who our God is. Very patient. He's saying, be careful, Cain. I'm here. I love you. I will accept you. I will have favor upon you. I will do all. I'm, I'm here for you, but be careful. Be careful, Cain. You, you're at a fork in the road. One path leads to righteousness. Leads to a right relationship with me. The other path leads down a dark alley where sin is crouching like a lion, ready to pounce you and devour you. Cain, be careful. Control your thoughts. Control your actions. Choose properly. Master this moment. You can do it, Cain. 
Be careful. It's kind of like when you're chastising a child and you see their face begin to just bunch up and you can tell that they're thinking something naughty. They're getting ready to lash out. I mean, little children, have you seen this? They'll just get it on their face and they'll look at something and you can just sense almost immediately they're going to pick that up and swing it at their, at, their, at their younger brother or sister. You're like, be careful. Don't do it. Don't we want our kids that way? Right? Be careful. Don't do that. Calm down now. Lest that anger destroy you. Lest you make an action and a choice you can't take back. Be careful. That's God's warning to Cain. I love you, Cain. I want you to have a right relationship with me, but you're going down a dark road. Watch out. Don't go any further. Turn around. Go over to this road instead. Be careful, Cain. Sin is right there. And you're about to make a choice you will forever regret. So Cain leaves, goes out and works in the field. In my mind, as I see this, I, I sometimes see things play out like a movie. Whenever I get offended, like I see Cain getting offended, sometimes I'll replay it in my mind like, like a preview or like a, a, like a record with a scratch. I'll keep replaying the situation in my mind. I wish I would have said this. Oh, never do anything like that. You know, I wish I would have said, if I, oh, if they would have came at me like this, I would have said this, and they would have done this, and I would have done that, and that would have shown them. And next thing you know, you're angry all over again about something that never happened. <laughs> okay? It's just to keep spiraling around in the mind like that. And so Cain's out in the field. He's working. Oh, boy, he's ticked. Eventually, he's got, he's got his plan set up, and he calls out to his brother. And so verse 8, and Cain told Abel his brother. Usually as a translator, that he calls out to him to come to the field. So Cain calls out and tells Abel, come to my field with me. And it came about that when they were in the field, that Cain commits premeditated murder. Not a crime of passion, not, a, not temporary insanity, or all the other junk things that tries to get through our court systems. This is planned out, thought out. Cain, uh, Abel's the problem. Uh, Abel's the obstacle. That's what Cain is thinking. It, it would be fine if it weren't for Abel. Uh, my jealousy is going to lead to total rage, total hatred. If I can just remove the obstacle, life would be better. Many of us have been down that path. We might not have actually carried out and committed murder, or our conversations would be a little bit different right now. You would be behind little bar things, and I would be here, and, and it would be different. <laughs> but we've had attitudes like that. How many times have you, maybe like me, have had thoughts, if so-and-so were just gone, life would be simpler? If so-and-so, I hope so-and-so doesn't show up at work today. I hope so-and-so just moves away. I hope they get something happens and they have to go so I don't have to deal with them today. That type of hatred. Jesus equates that with murder. Not that that's an excuse for murder. But Jesus says you have the same type of attitude. That type of bad attitude going on. So he calls out to Cain, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Cain kills his brother. The slaughter happens. And he kills his brother. God, the ultimate CSI, <laughs> shows up to the scene. And he starts to quiz Cain. Much like he quizzed Adam. Much like he quizzes Paul in the New Testament. Seems like God's a big quizzer. Actually, God's all about people confessing their sin. So God shows up, goes to Cain, and says, Where is Abel, your brother? Where is he? Now, God knows. God's not an idiot. He's the all-seeing, all-knowing, omnipotent, omnipresent Lord, creator of all that is, all there is. That's who God is. He knows where Abel is. He wants Cain to confess this. He wants Cain to get a chance to admit his sin. And so he asked Cain, where's your brother? How does Cain respond? Oh, 
<laughs> Man, if I use these words to my wife, you'd be forming a search committee for a different reason. Okay, <laughs> that's how that would work. Okay, check, check this out. And Cain said, I do not know. He's lying, number one. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I his babysitter? Am I his designated driver? Am I hooked up to him by the wrist? Am I this or that? That's, he's, it's like, what, what do you expect of me? Rhetorically, it's ironic, actually. The answer is yes. He's the older brother. What's the responsibility of the older brother of the family? Right? The protector. He's posted to watch out for his little brother. That's what big brothers are supposed to do. Look out for the little. So am I my brother's keeper? Ironically, the community that would be reading this when Moses wrote this post around the Exodus time period at the Mount Sinai after they left Egypt, that's when Moses is writing this. That's when God is having Moses write this down. That community would look at that phrase. Am I my brother's keeper? They would say, absolutely. Yes, you're your brother's keeper. How dare you treat your brother that way? He was your little brother. Minds would go back to Joseph. Minds would go to so many other events in history where brother turns against brother. And then God says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Abel has not said a single documented word in this entire story, but his blood screams. Catch that. And don't miss that. Your blood, Abel's blood, is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. In other words, he just took away his job. Everything Cain knew, he was a ground worker. No more. You will not be successful in that endeavor. You shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. You can't go home. It is over. All that comfort that you knew, all that you held dear, all that you thought you had, it's gone. You leave home and you start someplace else, something different. You cannot come back. You are a wanderer on the earth. And then Cain cries out to God an expression. This expression has also created various amounts of debate. What is it that Cain says to God? Most translations say something like this. This is how the New American Standard words it in verse 13. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden, and I shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. It will come about that whoever finds me will kill me. That's how most translations have it. That he is a whiner saying, oh, this punishment is too bad. Oh, it's just, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Oh, God, come on. you got to... Uh. That's how most translations have it. I'm going to challenge that they've mistranslated this. I'm going to challenge that completely. Here is how the Septuagint reads it. In case you don't know, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, it, it, I think better captures how the Hebrew is actually worded here. Because the words that are here, punishment can work for it, but the punishment has a very unique particulate to it. It goes a very interesting direction and is actually rarely ever translated with the word punishment because of how this word functions. This word is more about iniquity. It's more about sin than it is really punishment. Okay, the punishment would point to the sin. And so this is really about sin, not about punishment. That's what's happening here. Okay, and the whole idea of bearing is not the idea of Cain's bearing. It's the idea of what you do in order to bear something. This attitude of forgiveness is actually going on with that word. So here's how the Septuagint reads it. It's a Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, likely the translation Jesus would, would have read from. And Cain said to the Lord God, My sin is too great for me to be forgiven. That's how it reads out of here. And by the way, how it reads out of the Hebrew. 
My sin is too great for me to be forgiven. He finally, it's like a wake-up call. He finally realizes what he has done. He finally realizes what has taken place. It just, the, the dots finally get connected. He now sees, knows that there's blood in the garden that he was working with. There's blood on the ground. Come birthday time, the chair is going to be empty. The candles won't be lit. Come dinner, there will be an extra place at the table that's hollow. If Cain, when he has kids, they will never know their uncle. Forever he is gone from the face of the earth. He has killed with his own hands, possibly even his younger twin, but definitely his younger brother. With his own hands, the brother who he helped raise, who he played with, who he you know, ran around the yards with, who he maybe done practical jokes with, who he talked to, his brother, he will never hear that voice again. And he finally gets that punishment and he looks over and he realizes, my, my sin. He sees it. The punishment points him to his sin. That's how that word is used with the word punishment. It points to sin. And he sees that. And it breaks him. His heart cracks inside. And he says, my sin is so great. I can't bear it. I can't forgive it. I can't forgive myself. My sin can't be forgiven. Who could bear such a thing? The reason this verse causes so much confusion is because of God's miraculous blessing that happens afterwards. Where God lessens his punishment. He's no longer just a wanderer. He is able to build a city. That brother, Adam and Eve, can reconceive and replace, if you will, that brother with Seth. They're able to have another child. Cain's children are able, Cain's able to have kids. He gets a family of his own. And his children are able to develop metallurgy. And they're able to develop musical instruments and music and write beautiful songs and sounds. So much blessing is there. And people say, why did God bless? It's because Cain was broken. And people say, well, he never said, I'm sorry. It's the attitude of the entire thing is, I'm sorry. Look at even what he is saying there after he had uh, called out. He said, behold, you have driven me to stay from the face of the ground. From your face I shall be hidden. He longs to go back to worship God again. He is driven from the presence of the Lord like Adam and Eve were from the garden. They were driven out. It doesn't mean they were lost forever. It means that they have that separation that's there and that things won't ever be exactly the same again. But God, it becomes with Cain again and blesses him and his family. What we find is a story of restoration of a murderer who ends up having a life of restoration. Sound like anybody in the New Testament who killed people? Never said the words, I'm sorry, but clearly had the repentant heart. Saul becoming Paul. Similar type of situation there. Where a guy realized, God questioned him, why do you persecute me, came the question to Paul. Why do you persecute me? Why are you? He said, what do you mean? have I persecuted you when you killed these people? And he recognized his sin. And broken, Paul became. Was Paul blessed afterwards? Yeah. Just as Cain was. Sometimes we ourselves might feel like our sins are too great for us to bear. 
sins of adultery, sins of pornography, sins of lying, sins of profanity, sins of lust, sins of greed, sins of jealousy, sins of hate, sins of selfishness and arrogance and pride. Sometimes we show up to an offering of God filled with wickedness. For 1 John 3.12 would describe us instead of Cain. Wicked we approach. Almost as if our allegiance is more to Satan than it is to God. And if Cain and Saul and Adam and Eve can be forgiven and restored, so can we. So can you. That the sin that you have in your life can be forgiven. Sometimes consequences for sins will remain. Cain never did go back home. He built the city someplace else. Some consequences remain. Sometimes jobs are lost. Jail sentences are served. Marriages are destroyed and they can't be repaired. Sometimes things like that happen. But there is restoration. God can restore you back to Him. You are not too lost. So now God's calling out. Every day, God's calling out to you. Where are you? Those are His words echoing. Maybe you've even heard them in the back of your mind or in the hollowness of your chest. Where are you? Why don't you turn back to me? Why don't you turn to me? And God's open arms are calling out. Forgiveness is possible. We all have sin. Every single one of us have fallen short of God's glory. We can't fix it. Religion cannot fix it. People cannot fix it. Only God can fix it. That is why Jesus came as a sacrifice for all sins, for all time. That God can forgive in the beginning and God can forgive in the end. All because of Jesus. Forgiveness and restoration is with God only. That's it. Jesus only. That's it. And he's calling out to you. Now, where are you? Why are you dwelling so much in your anger? Why are you toiling so much with your sin, with your lust, with your jealousy? Just give it to God. Repent. Let him restore you. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Heavenly Father.